All right. How are we? Are we awake? Hey, well, we are jumping into a new series called Something Special, and I'm excited to jump into this. And really, our hope for this series is that throughout this series that you would realize that you're not actually defined by some of the things that you might tell yourself, that you're actually not defined by some of the things other people may say to you, but that God actually thinks you're pretty special. And I know some of you are like, oh, that's kind of cheesy, but that's true. And over the next few weeks, we want to unpack that. We want to remind you that you're God's child. We want to tell you that you are his. You are a part of his family and that you're welcome here. And so I'm just excited to jump into this and to help us realize and answer the question, who am I? Our identity. And I want to really talk about that tonight. Now, if I'm honest with you guys, and you have to be real, because I've heard some of you um, and how you talk about yourself and what you think about yourself, because I've had conversations with some of you, some of you in this room are your own worst critic. And maybe there's other people, like friends in the room, that can be like, I know what you say about yourself, or I know what you think. I think we can be our own worst enemy, that by the things that we do, uh, for example, our athletics, if we had a bad game, or we have a bad pass, or we have, we missed five tackles, all of a sudden, because of that, we're like the worst, most unathletic person we've ever met. And that's what we tell ourselves. Or if we get a bad grade on a test, or we turn in a homework assignment and we fail, it's like, all of a sudden, we're a bad student. Or if we don't respond to a friend, or we forget their birthday, all of a sudden, in our minds, we tell ourselves. I'm a horrible friend. And some of you are like, no, that's not true. But you do that. I do that. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we have a false sense of identity of who we are. And maybe if you're like, no, I don't really necessarily think that I have that. Maybe you know people who have a false sense of identity of who they are. They think that they're one thing, but they're actually not. Let me give a few funny examples. Uh, you know those people in your life that they say, I am a really good driver. And then you get in a car with them and you're swaying side to side and you didn't even know that you had like motion sickness, like that's never been a thing, but all of a sudden you have motion sickness. And all of a sudden they're slamming on the brakes and you're like, what just happened? And you're like, I don't actually think you're a good driver, you're just saying that. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I've always said that I'm a pretty good driver. Until a couple weeks ago, when I forgot to put my car in park. And my car slid down this hill and hit another car and destroyed their door. Brad saw it. He had to call me and say, Sav, we have a situation. And I don't know if that means I'm a bad driver or if I'm just an airhead. You can tell me. Okay, but you know those people in your life. Or... Do you ever have some of those people in your life that they're like really convinced they're a good singer? But then they open their mouth and you're like, oh no. Like it's like nails on a chalkboard and you're like, oh, you're, you're a singer. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I was watching old American Idol and voice auditions and the people that go on these shows and, like, are so convinced they're the next American Idol and then tell the judges, yeah, I'm tone deaf and I've never sang. And you're like, what are you, why are you on this show? I don't understand. Or um, maybe, and I, I always got to pick on Shadrach, and he's here tonight. Or maybe you're just so confident that you're one of the best dancers and you get up at Raft Trip and can only do this move. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Evan, you're a good dancer. You're a good dancer. I had a friend that was so, listen, listen, I had a friend um, that really wanted to be a drummer. This was in middle school, and we kind of, like, tested out the instruments, and she was like, I got to do the drums. But she was, like, that friend that, like, you know in worship songs and, like, clap songs that was, like, we're all clapping, and then she's, like, like, she can never, like, be on beat. You know those people? Like, you might sit by them in church, and you're, like, like, keep the beat. Like, just watch the person next to you. And so she decided 
she decided to do drums for a year, and at the end of the year, like, she not ever was on beat. And the director was like, hey, like, let's try the saxophone. Like, this may not <laughs> actually um, be your thing. Now, those are just funny examples about a false sense of identity, who we are. But on a serious note, we do that to ourselves. And it might not be in those things, but we tell ourselves things and we convince ourselves that we are one way. But we're actually not. And as I was thinking through this message, I really began to think of the different lies of where we find our identity. And I came up with three that I think all fit into the different avenues of what we could believe about who we are. And so if you have your notes, I want to give you the three. The first one, I think we find our identity in what we do. I am what I do. We tend to believe that we're actually the things that we do. Like, I am a youth pastor. I am a wife. I'm a daughter. For you guys, I am a football player. I am a basketball player. I am a dancer. I am a good friend. I am a listener. I have a servant's heart. I am a joyful person. I am a goofball. I am all these different things that we could come up with. We actually put our identity in the things that we do. And don't tell me that we don't do it because I've had conversations with people in this room that will say, Saf, trust me, if I'm not cracking the jokes or being the comic relief at practice or at school, like, I let down people. Like, that's just who I am. I have to be on all the time. Or I'm always joyful and happy. I can't ever have a bad day because people just know me to be this way. So, like, that is who I am. And I've seen other students that really just take work or their passions or athletics, and that becomes their identity, the things that they do. You know, you see athletes that finish out of the NFL or college or even high school, and they're done with their sport, the thing that they're doing, and they don't know who they are. It's true. One of my best friends, who was an amazing three-point shooter that I played with at Bethel, called me after we graduated, and she said, Sav, I'm not trying to be dramatic but I truly don't know who I am without the sport of basketball. Because she had found her identity in that for the last 20 some years is where she placed it. And if I'm honest with you guys, and just real, I probably struggle with this lie the most. Because for me, and maybe you're like me, I tend to believe that I'm only loved by people for what I do for them. So if I'm not doing something for someone or listening to someone or asking questions to someone or if I'm not the best coach or if I'm not the best youth pastor or the best wife or daughter or sister, then all of a sudden that I failed because I'm not doing that well. My identity is like I'm a failure because I did not do those things well. And maybe you're like me and you can relate to that. That sometimes if you are actually honest with yourself, you find your identity and your worth in what you do. The second one, I am what people say about me. And I think we can all relate to this because no matter what age, no matter if you say, no, I don't really care what people think, I think there's always a little part of us that does. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be different. We don't want to stand alone. We don't want to be made fun of. We want people to speak highly about us. But sometimes we tend to believe that our identity is actually found in what people say about us. The good things people say about us and the bad things. For example, I remember hearing a story, and this is a true story, of this guy. And maybe a few of you have heard me share this story. His name was Victor. He grew up in Russia and there was two parents in the United States that wanted to adopt him. So they adopted him, they flew him to the United States, and he's, his American parents just threw him right into kindergarten as, at five years old. And I can't even imagine being Victor, trying to learn a new culture, a new language, new experiences, new people, everything. And his teachers, as a five-year-old, told him that he was slow, that he would always be behind, that he was never going to 
probably make it past middle school. And because his teacher started saying those things, his peers and his friends in his class started saying those things. So Victor automatically just started to believe, oh, well, that must be true about me. And he continued to believe that until he was 16 years old, and he was just so discouraged because he was so behind that he actually dropped out of high school. He's like, I'm not doing this anymore. Turns out, a few years later, when he was 29 years old, Victor decided to take the aptitude test, which basically is the deciding factor if you're really, really smart or not. And he scored 161 IQ, which is like a genius. For years, Victor was convinced that he was dumb. He wasn't going to make it. That he was always behind. Victor all of a sudden didn't just become smart when he turned 29. He was smart all along. What happened was he believed what people said that he was. And a cool part of that story is after taking that test, Victor, his whole mindset changed, and he actually became a really successful businessman. But for the majority of his life, he actually believed he was only not going to make it. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, there have been some things that have been said to you guys that you've actually decided are true, even though that they're not. And you've, you're living in a way right now of those things that people have said that have been hurtful to you and believing that. Just another lie that we fall into. And the last one, I am what I have. I am what I have. This one we may not think of right away, but I think it's there. I think our identity comes in what we have, our family, right? Family circumstances, who's in our family, if it's good or bad, our school and our grades, our good health, our house, our possessions, materialism. We don't think about this a lot, and it's like, oh, I'm not really materialistic. But it's like when you don't have that or when one of those items is failing, what happens in your life? I see this all the time um, when people, their health deteriorates, and they're like, who am I without I have a broken leg, I can't do the things I used to. Or who am I when I'm super sick and I'm in the hospital and i not who I used to be? I remember sitting with a girl, this was a couple years ago, she was a middle school student, and she just said, Sav, my parents are getting a divorce. And I just, I don't know who I am anymore. And my heart sank. I was so broken for her, I couldn't even imagine being in her shoes and what she was feeling. And we talked, I encouraged her, I prayed for her, and I left thinking, man, my heart breaks for that. Hard situation. But even our family is not where our identity is found in. Three lies of where we find our identity. I am what I do. I am what people say about me. And I am what I have. False sense of identity. And I believe if we're honest, we can fall into one of those categories or at sometimes all of them. So what do we do about that? I want to take us straight to Scripture and talk to you about our true identity. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and it's in your notes. It'll be on the screen. And this might be a little weird, but I actually want to look at Jesus' baptism, okay? Jesus was a Jew. He was perfect. He was sinless. He actually didn't really need to be baptized. But he gets baptized. And I'm like, what? Why? We're going to answer that question as we read this passage and really find out where our identity is. And it's straight here in this passage. Matthew chapter 3, 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The reasoning to be baptized was to announce Jesus' ministry. But that act itself 
proved to be even more significant than I think we even realized because Jesus' baptism actually pleased the heart of Jesus so much that he used it as an opportunity to declare to the world that this Galilean carpenter's son was actually the son of God. It says, this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased. This baptism testified to the identity of Jesus as the Christ, the anointed one. And some of you are like, wow, that's cool. What does that mean for us? Here's what I hope you get, and it's not something new, and it's, not, it's probably something that you've heard, but we've got to understand this because when we do, it changes how we live. I believe this full heartedly. Our true identity is God's child, period. Our true identity is God's child. It's not in what we do. It's not in what other people say about us. And it's not even the things that we have. It's simply that we're his kids. But I think it's interesting, and I don't know if you guys caught this, and I recently caught this over the last few years, but if you look immediately after Jesus' baptism, where his identity is shown to the world, like this, Jesus is the son of God, Jesus is then led out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, immediately after Jesus' baptism. And he's faced with three different lies and temptations. The first lie, listen to this, Matthew 14, 3. During that time, the devil came to Jesus and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. What's Satan telling him? He's telling him to do something. The lie of I am what I do. If you're truly the son of God, prove that you can do this. Lie number two, Matthew 14, five through six. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and he said, if you are the son of God, jump off. The second lie that we talked about, the lie of what other people think. Satan takes Jesus to the highest point of the city, the temple, one of the most populated places, and he says, jump off. Show the people how cool you are, that your angels can protect you. What people think. And lie number three, Matthew 4, 8 through 9. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Lie number three, I am what I have. I will give you the kingdoms of the world and the glory, is what Satan tells Jesus. And Jesus combats all of those lies with truth, straight scripture, and with confidence that his identity is the son of God. And our identity is the same. We're God's kids, but I think so often we have a false sense of identity and who we truly are, that we lose sight of the simple truth That you are his son. You are his daughter, who he loves. This week, um, I was reading, I don't even know how I really came across it, but um, a book called You Are Special by Max Lucado. And maybe some of you have read this. It's a kid's book. And some of you are like, why are you reading a kid's book? I don't know. Um, But it was so good for me, and I actually got emotional reading it. And I want to summarize the story for you guys a little bit and then read the last page because it was so meaningful to me and I think just fits right along with this. So basically, in this story, uh, there's a woodworker, okay? His name is Eli. And Eli, and this is important, you got to remember the names here. Eli made all of the Wemmicks. They're wood people, okay? These are the Wemmicks. He made all of them. Very different, special, unique, tall, short, And these Wemmicks, every single day, would go out and hand out gold stars and black dots that were stickers. And the gold stars, as you can see in the picture, the gold stars were the good things. If your wood was all nice and smooth, if you took care of yourself, if you were talented, if you were faster than other people, if you could jump higher, if you had the most possessions, if you were well off, you got gold stickers. On the other hand, if you weren't as good, 
or your wood was chipped and you didn't look as good as other people, they would hand out black dots. So here we have this dude, Punchinello, put him on the screen here. Poor guy, wanted so badly to get stars. Could not get stars. Wasn't fast enough, wasn't strong enough, his wood was chipping. He was so frustrated, in fact, he was actually so ashamed, he actually stayed inside. He didn't want to even go out because he was embarrassed because of how many dots he had, and he tried so hard to get the stars. As we look at Punchinello, we see that he's frustrated. Punchinello goes out one day and meets this girl named Lucia, and Lucia has no stickers, no stars, no dots. And Punchinello's like, how do you not have any stickers on you? I don't understand. Please tell me. And she said, I go see Eli every day. And he's like, well, I'm about to go see Eli then. So the next day, Punchinello goes to Eli. And Eli's in his shop. And we'll put a picture of Eli up in his shop with Punchinello. And Punchinello walks in, and Eli looks down at Punchinello, and he says, Punchinello. And Punchinello says, how did you know my name? And Eli said, well, I made you. And Eli said, right to Punchinello, he said, it looks like you have a lot of bad marks on you. And Punchinello said, I really tried. I'm trying to do my best. I'm just not as good as other people. And Eli said, you don't have to defend yourself to me. I actually don't care what other people think of you. The only thing that matters is what I think of you. And Punchinello was a little confused. In fact, he was like, what do you mean? And Eli said, you know, you're pretty special. And Punchinello said, but compared to all the other people, I'm not special. I can't do what they do. I don't have what they have. And this is where I kind of want to pick up on the story. He said, if I can find it here. He said, I love you because I made you. And that means you're pretty special to me. And Eli just continued to look at Punchinello with his soft eyes. And Punchinello sat there. And he said, well, okay, Eli, tell me, why don't the stickers stick to Lucia then? You love me. I'm special. How, wh what's the thing that she's got going that I don't have going? I'm a little confused. And he said, the stickers don't stick on Lucia because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. Stickers only stick if you let them. They only stick if they matter to you. And Punchinello said, I don't, I don't understand that. And Eli said, you will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much that I love you. And then I love this last part of the book. He said, Punchinello, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. And I love this story, and I got a little bit emotional because I think Punchinello describes me and how I can find my identity in all of these different things. I can find my identity and have before in the sports that I play and my performance. If I do bad, it's like I'm horrible. Find my identity and who I am and my possessions and the money. Find my identity, and I've heard this from a lot of students, and academics and grades, and trying to do the very best for your parents, but just feeling like you're not enough. Finding your identity. And your friends, if your friendships are good, then you're good, right? What's our identity in our friendships? Finding our identity in our family, in our family life, and what's happening in our family. Our looks, our personality. And then I think, too, if we're really honest, and this is probably hard to say, but some of the things that people have said to us that we find our identity in, that we actually sometimes believe are true that we're worthless, 
that we're not good enough, that we're weak, that we'll never make it in the world based off of even some of people that have come in your family and just haven't made it. Some of you are defined still by your past, whether it's a good past or a bad past. And that's your identity. The comment that you're dumb. Comparison. That somebody else is better than you in something. I wish you could be more like. Or the, just the simple comment that you're weird. And I think there's so many more things that we could put on here that define who we are. That we have a false sense of identity with. And here's the thing, and I hope that you caught that in the story that Eli is symbolic to Jesus. That we're actually not those things. That God is saying that all that matters is what I think. That you're pretty special because you're mine. That that's why you matter to me. That he doesn't make mistakes. That he loves you because you are his son and daughter. And I think no matter where we're at in our faith tonight, that we need to be reminded of this. That really, at the end of the day, we're not these things. That we're simply God's child. That we don't have to do enough to be God's child, but you're already God's child. You don't have to have a certain amount of things in order to be good with God. He loves you right where you're at. That no matter what people say about you, what they think about you actually doesn't matter. What matters is what your Heavenly Father thinks of you, and at the end of the day, you're his kid, and he loves you because he made you, and you're his. But yet, sometimes we get so confused in the culture that we live in because it's like, I just got to do enough to be enough so that I'm loved. Or we let what people say be what we believe about ourselves and how we live and what we have affect how we see ourselves. Where at the end of the day, you need to know that God loves you right where you're at. And so as we close, I want to invite the band up. And while they come up, I want to invite you right now to kind of stick your notes away, put your pens down, and just to simply close your eyes. That you would take just a second in the midst of maybe all that's going on in your mind to just pause, to focus straight on Jesus. I don't know how you picture Jesus. I want to invite you to close your eyes right now and picture him with his arms wide open here in this room right now. That no matter where you're at in your faith, whether you've been a Christian a really long time or you're still asking questions, that you would know in this moment that he loves you. That you're his kid. It's not cheesy to say because I think a lot of the times we just live as if we're not his kid and we got to make it for ourselves. when really we don't. We just get to sit in his lap and be his child, knowing we don't have to do anything, knowing other people's opinions doesn't matter, that he loves us just as we are. And so as we close, I want to read these words of truth over you guys that are found straight from Scripture, straight from the heart of Jesus, of what he says about you. This world will tell you a lot of things that you are. You will probably tell yourself that a lot of different things that you think that you are. But I want you to hear tonight, and I want these words to resonate in your heart who you actually are. My child, I have called you by name. From the very beginning, you are mine, and I am yours. You are my beloved. On you, my favor rests. I have molded you in the depths of the earth and knitted you together in your mother's womb. I have carved you in the palm of my hands and have hidden you in the shadows of my embrace. I look at you with infinite tenderness and care for you with a care more intimate than that of a mother for her child. 
I have counted every hair on your head and guided you every step. Wherever you go, I go with you. And wherever you rest, I keep watch. I will give you food that will satisfy all your hunger and drink that will quench all your thirst. I will not hide my face from you. You know me as your own as I know you as my own. Wherever you are, I will be. Nothing will ever separate us. I'm gonna invite you right now to open your eyes. And would you, right where you are, just stand to your feet. And I wanna encourage us, we're gonna close with one last song. And in this song, it proclaims who we are. And I wanna invite you with everything in you to sing these words out that this is true of who you are. That it's not what the world tells you. It's not what even your parents tell you. It's not what your friends tell you. That this is who you are. This is your identity as God's kid. And when we sing that out with confidence and maybe even tonight, start believing it. Jesus, I pray that as we close in this song that there would be big moments for students where they would start to understand that their identity should only be found in you. You are the only one that will ever fill any hole within us, Jesus. God, that in this room that there are students that so desperately need you. And God, I need you. And so Jesus, would you show yourself to us in this room? Would you remind us that you're here, that you've never left us, that you love us, that you see us, and that you will continue to fight for us, God. God, may we proclaim these words of truth because this is who we are. It's in your name we pray.